Kazuya Kagami, the unluckiest boy who has accidents happen to him whenever he goes. This even includes when his mother went to go get the milk and never came back, like my father. Fortunately for Kazuya, a girl came out of his cloth one day saving his life. However, fortunately may be a little understatement considering what she does to him. Just as he thought his life may get a little more interesting and peaceful, more strange beings comes into his boring life, making his life a daily party. Earlier in the day, this disgusting loser Kazuya had a vivid dream where he pleaded with a girl hidden under a cloth not to leave. When he woke up, he accidentally touched Chisato's chest in class, which infuriated her, and she Chris breezied him as his friends Shiru and Osamu witnessed the embarrassing incident. After Chisato scolded him, Kazuya went to the school roof to contemplate his strange dream while holding a cloth he believed might be connected to it. He then noticed my grandma's wig on the floor, however, due to my grandma not conditioning her hair, it unexpectedly grabbed him. Chisato came looking for Kazuya, but the wig vanished like my dad and reappeared attacking him again, causing him to fall from the roof. In a miraculous twist, a beautiful girl emerged from the cloth and saves Kazuya from the fall. She introduced herself as Kiria, but he doesn't seem to recognize her, and this gets him a one-way ticket to getting knocked out. Suddenly, another girl wearing the same wig as my grandma appeared and attacks Kazuya, but unfortunately the girl protected him. Kiriha decides to make a deal with Kazuya if he agrees to follow her instructions. Kazuya being the loser he is, agrees and they engaged in a bow, with Kiriha easily defeating the other girl, revealing that this useless girl was being actually controlled by my grandma's wig. After the conflict, Kazuya asked Kiriha why his classmate had attacked him, and she explained that the wig had been possessed by his classmate's romantic feelings, turning her into an amasogi, a creature born from desire. That may have been one of our exes to be honest. <laughs> Kazuya being the loser he is blushed at the idea of someone having feelings for him. Thankfully Kiria shut down his pathetic hopes real quick, revealing that the host's spirit was actually a cross-dressing male. Kiriha vanished like my father to avoid getting caught by a teacher, and Kazuya returned home, greeted his sister, and went to his room. Still processing the events of the day, he took a nap and was surprised to find Kiriha sleeping beside him when he woke up. Startled, he tried to hide her from his sister when she came to check on him. Once alone, Kiriha asserted her authority as his master and ordered Kazuya lose herself to buy food for her and pudding. While out buying food, Kazuya, being the loser he is forgot to get the pudding, which almost made her crisp breezy him. Later, during dinner, Kiriha caused some noise in his room, and Kazuya tried to divert his sister's attention to prevent suspicion, which somehow worked. Later, when it was time to sleep, Kazuya and Kiriha shared his bed for the night. Meanwhile, Kokayu observed a curse spreading through the city and received instructions on how to handle it from a mysterious voice. The next morning, Kazuya woke up to find himself running late for school. Despite his efforts to wake his half-human partner Kiriha, she didn't stir. In a rush, he hurried to his class only to be scolded by the lovely teacher for being tardy. Adding on, she said double it and give it to the next person and also endured a beating from Chisato in front of his friends for him being a loser like ourselves. Suddenly, he woke up again, realizing it was all just a dream. But upon waking up for real, he discovered he was indeed running late. In a hurry, Kazuya tried to leave without Kiriha, fearing she'd treat him like a servant. However, she insisted on going with him to prevent him from getting into trouble. Reluctantly, he manages to convince Kiriha to transform into her obai form, intending to carry her discreetly. Instead, he tricked her and left her tied up in a box, going to school alone. At school, Kazuya had lunch with Shiru and Osamu, and they discussed ghost sightings, with Shiru entertaining the idea of impressing a girl. Chisato overheard and scolded them, reminding them of their pending work. Realizing he hadn't completed his assignments, Kazuya sought help from Osamu, but Chisato intervened and dragged him to the library to supervise him personally. While studying together, Kazuya and Chisato reminisced about their childhood and the time they spent studying together. As Kazuya went to take a book from the library, he found Kiriha there, and of course with no hesitation she attacked him. Chisato tried to leave but discovered she couldn't open the library door. Kiriha revealed herself as Kazuya's cousin and explained the concept of Amasogi and Netsuk. They started searching for Amasogi, and the library transformed into a hall of books, with a motherfucking book golem chasing them. Kiriha realized Chisato was the host of the Amasogi, triggered by Kazuya rejecting her offer to study together. Chisato arrived at Kazuya's house to study but found him sleeping with Kiriha. Angry, she hit him, but Kiriha reassured her that it wasn't her fault. Kiriha blamed Kyukuri for not managing the curse properly. Shiru encountered Kokayu on the streets and she inquired about Kazuya Kagami. At school, Shiru greeted Kazuya with a dropkick, blaming him for past troubles. But in another flashback, Shiru treated Kokayu to a meal, but she ate excessively, leaving him with the bill. In the present, Shiru confessed his financial troubles and debt to Osamu to Kazuya, 
who was unaware of the woman looking for him. Kokayu defended her behavior, blaming the shrine's lack of resources, but Kyukuri urged her to bring Kazuya quietly, without involving Kiriha. Suddenly, Kokayu burst into the classroom with stolen lunches, demanding to know Kazuya's whereabouts. Shiru recognized her, but she couldn't remember him. A humorous situation ensued, leading to Kokayu asking Kazuya to come along, sparking an argument with Kiriha. On the school roof, Kiriha and Kokayu decided to resolve their dispute through arm wrestling. Although I'm not sure if you can even call this arm wrestling. The next day, Kokayu took them to visit Kyukuri who is considered a god, where of course, Kiriha found a way to get in an argument with her, but this loser Kazuya intervened. Privately, Kiriha confronted Kyukuri about the weakening seal on Kazuya's memories and suggested reapplying it or his mind could explode. However, Kyukuri refused and proposed making Kazuya the region's exorcist to deal with SS rank threats. Kira disagreed, concerned for Kazuya's safety as Kyukuri revealed Kazuya's connection to recent Amasogi occurrences. When Kira tries to flee with Kazuya they found themselves full boxed. As tension escalated, Kokayu prepared for a possible fight, and Kyukuri readied to confront Kiriha and Kazuya. Kiriha attempted to fly away but was struck down by Kyukuri's attack, Minazuchi, engulfing them in water. During the intense battle, Kyukuri uses a powerful move called Minazuchi on Kiriha and Kazuya. Kiriha tries to shield them from the attack with her clothes, but she is weakened and shrinks in size. As she launches another attack, and with Kiriha unwilling to protect the useless folks this time, he becomes unconscious underwater due to the force of the attack. While unconscious, Kazuya has a dream in which a mysterious woman advises him to stop being a loser and protect her. He wakes up to find Kiriha giving him air through mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and they manage to reach the surface of the water. Ah! It should have been me, not him! It's not fair! Kazuya asks Kiriha to return to her cloth form but she refuses. Instead, Kazuya addresses Kiriha by her true name and declares that he will fight and protect her. To his relief, Kiriha agrees and returns to her normal form. Kyukuri attempts to use a move called Suzuro Mizuchi, but Kazuya counters it with a technique called the Watershed Weave. Feeling confident, Kazuya follows up with a powerful attack called the Spiral Weave, successfully shattering Kyukuri's ice barrier. However, to Kazuya's shock, he sees Kiriha being held by Kyukuri with an ice spear dangerously close to her neck. In a desperate situation, Kazuya agrees to become an exorcist, complying with Kyukuri's demands to save Kiriha. The battle concludes, and Kyukuri's Akuju falls off, causing her to transform into a childlike state. Kiriha teases Kyukuri in her new form, but Kyukuri reveals that the battle was all part of a plan to bring Kazuya closer to Kiriha and convince him to become an exorcist, leaving Kazuya surprised and shocked by the revelation. After the battle, Kazuya carries Kiriha back home, and they have a bath together. She recalls a private conversation she had with the midget back at the shrine before leaving. At home, Kazuya realizes that she has become very small after the battle. He takes care of her, ensuring she's not hurt and providing her with sweet pudding to eat. Concerned about Kiriha's current clothes not fitting well, Kazuya decides to find better fitting ones for her. He considers asking his sister Kasumi for old clothes, but he hesitates due to possible misunderstandings. Instead, Kazuya reaches out to his friend Osamu for help, and Osamu provides the clothes. Hey, yo, what the However, for some reason this motherfucker actually has some clothes that can fit her new body. The next day at school, Osamu playfully confronts Kazuya about the clothes, leading to humorous misunderstandings that Kazuya tries to clarify. As Kazuya undergoes training with Kiriha, she becomes increasingly frustrated with his lack of physical strength and skill. During a relaxing bath, Kiriha takes the opportunity to explain the vulnerabilities and mortality of Tsugumomo, shedding light on the risks they face. Meanwhile, at the Hakusen Shrine, Kyukuri and Kokayu find themselves in dire financial straits as they struggle to repair their sacred place. Their carpentry Tsukimagami, essential for the repairs, cannot work without payment. To temporarily cover the shrine's holes, they leave some useless cloth. Back at Kazuya's home, his struggles with weaving lead Kiriha to punish him and demonstrate the correct technique. Meanwhile, back at the Hakusen Shrine, Kyukuri faces difficulties in packaging a rose, and Kokayu comes to her aid, demonstrating the proper method. Later at Kazuya's home, a seemingly innocent Jenga game escalates when Kazuya accuses Kiriha of cheating. However, I'm pretty sure up to this point he's been getting played with his whole life. At the same time, back at the Hakusen Shrine, their home collapses in the rain, causing some chaos. Despite the Jenga Tower's fall, Kiriha believes something good has happened. Conversely, Kyukuri and Kokayu are faced with a challenging decision on where to find their next home. The group continues their training, with Chisato, Kyukuri, and Kokayu observing. 
Kyukuri questions the simplicity of the training, and Kiriha responds by explaining that Kazuya's previous victory was merely luck and not indicative of his true abilities. Kyukuri begins to panic, regretting her decision, and the group follows her and Kokayu to their little makeshift playground home, if that's what you want to call it. Kiriha finds the situation amusing, while Kyukuri reads the curse forecast, stating that there should be no curse-related problems in their new location. Amidst these events, Nakajima chuckles darkly while drawing in a secluded room. Kazuya meets the student council president, Tadeda Katadeda, who reveals himself as the owner of the previous hair my grandma wore. Tadeda informs them about a potential Amasogi problem, and they head to investigate. On their way, they encounter Asamu. Together, they find that the club room is missing, leading them to suspect an Amasogi's involvement and Kiriha's Heizakura quickly confirms their suspicions. Back at Kyukuri's new shrine, they discuss the outdated curse forecast, leading to unforeseen issues. The group returns but encounters a mysterious wall blocking their path. Nakajima appears and demands Tadeda officially recognize the tabletop RPG club. Tadeda refuses, and Nakajima summons a minotaur using his sketchbook Amasogi. The group finds themselves trapped by the wall and enter a classroom, only to face a dead end. Kira insists they confront the monster. Kazuya realizes the minotaur can be erased since it's a drawing. Nakajima and the minotaur enter the room, and Osamu and Tadeda try to fend it off with water, but to no avail. Kazuya seizes a fire extinguisher and successfully erases the minotaur's arm during a distraction. As the group returns to the hallway and erases the first wall, only to find another one behind it, and they run out of extinguisher, Nakajima corners them with another poorly drawn minotaur arm. Kazuya quickly summons Kiria and rushes to get another fire extinguisher nearby and somehow his useless self manages to erase the entire monster successfully. Nakajima faces the consequences of his actions, and Osamu learns about the dangerous Amasogi. To prevent curse backlash, Kiria hands Nakajima the sketchbook and urges him to destroy it. Nakajima destroys the book but reveals he had a hidden piece of paper, summoning another minotaur. However, Osamu reveals that he had swapped their sketchbooks and still possesses the Amasogi. Osamu summons a powerful flare dragon, destroying Nakajima's minotaur. The dragon's flames trigger the fire alarm, causing chaos in the area. After changing clothes, Osamu confronts Nakajima about his cheating, and Nakajima admits to his mistake. To teach Nakajima a lesson, Kiriha suggests that he should experience the same pain he caused others. As a result, Nakajima is coerced into drawing and summoning an adult version of Kiriha in lingerie. Oh look, let him The adult Kiriha humorously and mockingly stomps on Kazuya's private area, leaving everyone shocked. In the end, Nakajima realizes the consequences of his actions and decides to destroy his Amasogi, ending the mess. The whole experience leaves the group a bit flustered, but they continue on their journey, determined to face whatever challenges come their way as they navigate the world of Tsugumomo and Amasogi. On the school rooftop, Hiroshi gathers the courage to confess his love to Chisato, unaware that Kazuya and Kiriha are secretly watching. However, Chisato gently turns him down, revealing that she already has feelings for someone else. This leaves Hiroshi feeling sad and disappointed. Kazuya is shocked to learn about Chisato's crush, while Kiria is disappointed by Kazuya's mother freaking cluelessness. Later, Chisato visits Kazuya's room to help him study, while Kiriha enjoys playing video games. During their study session, Kazuya curiously asks Chisato about her crush, but she decides to keep it a secret. Kiria, in her playful nature, finds a doll in Chisato's bag, leading to a moment of embarrassment for her. Chisato quickly dismisses it as nothing important. Feeling frustrated after being rejected, Hiroshi seeks solace in computer games. However, his emotions manifest into an Amasogi, causing a series of unusual events at school. During the school day, Kazuya accidentally sees Tatami's panties, leading to an awkward encounter with her. As he settles into his classroom, he observes other students interacting as couples, and Shiru excitedly shares the fantastic opportunities offered by the dialogue system. Kiriha figures out that a gal game Amasogi is causing the romantic chaos in the school. Kazuya sets out to find the Amasogi but stumbles upon Chisato and Hiroshi together. When Kazuya approaches Chisato, she responds coldly and even slaps him. Kazuya seeks advice from Osamu, who suggests using custom dialogue to win Chisato back. With Osamu's guidance, Kazuya attempts to increase Chisato's affection through compliments and a study session. However, a free input conversation event causes a misunderstanding, leading to a decrease in Chisato's affection for Kazuya. Faced with a challenging situation, Kazuya, Osamu, and Kiriha strategize on how to handle it. 
Osamu suggests exploiting an event bug to maximize Kazuya's points with Chisato. Meanwhile, Hiroshi meets Chisato under the school's Sekura tree to confess, but Kazuya intervenes. To win Chisato over, Kazuya uses a pair of dolls from their childhood and suggests playing house together. Hey, yo, what the, f the nostalgic memories from their past strengthen their bond, and Chisato accepts Kazuya's proposal. Meanwhile, Osamu and Kiriha deal with the Amasogi and its source, a PC game in the computer lab based on explicit content. They manage to stop the game and destroy the Amasogi. The next day at school, Kazuya and Chisato sit awkwardly together while Osamu inquires about their relationship. However, the truth about their encounter in the nurse's room remains a mystery. At South Kamioka Park, Kiria confronts Kyukuri for providing incorrect curse forecast information. Kazuya tries to calm Kiriha down, but Kokayu arrives to inform Kyukuri that she has to leave for part-time work to cover their expenses. Kyukuri pushes Kiriha away, dons her Akujo mask, and attempts to use Minazuchi, which fails. Kiriha continues her aggressive approach, prompting Kazuya to intervene by enticing her with the promise of pudding. Kiriha releases her grip on Kyukuri and Kazuya goes to buy the pudding. In Kazuya's absence, Kiriha and Kyukuri engage in a conversation. Kiriha asks Kyukuri about her weakened strength, but Kyukuri can't reveal the reason yet and feels threatened. They decide to build a sand dam to divert their focus. However, their playful endeavor is interrupted when a soccer ball ruins their dam, leading to mocking by young lads. Kiriha chases after the young lads while Kazuya returns confused about the situation. At the Kagami household, Kyukuri and Kiriha wash each other, noticing changes in their bodies. Kyukuri observes that Kiriha's chest has become larger, and Kiriha realizes she has grown taller due to Kazuya's presence, indicating her power is returning. They continue their playful conversation, but overheating in the bath leads Kazuya to cool them down with a fan. After bidding farewell to Kyukuri, Kazuya returns to his family's dinner. Kiriha surprises him by joining in and playfully revealing her connection to his family. Kiriha and Kazuya visit the park to give Kyukuri and Kokayu pudding, only to find Kyukuri's shrine demolished. Kiriha promises to find another place for them to stay and convinces Kazuya's family to welcome them into their home. The following dawn, Kazuya wakes to find Kiriha nestled upon him. A chance run-in with Kokayu leads to a dramatic exchange. Kazuya, though, is still marvels at how he managed to persuade his father to accommodate their stay. Kiriha, Kyukuri, and Kazuya set out to borrow money for curse forecasts. At Kanara Shrine, Kiriha has Kyukuri call Taguri Kaneyama, and they engage in a game of concentration. The game takes a comically inappropriate turn, filled with suspicious challenges. Despite some embarrassing moments, Kiriha and Kyukuri ultimately win. However, their victory is short-lived when Taguri reveals a twist in the game's rules, leading to an embarrassing penalty for Kiriha and Kyukuri. Despite their ordeal, they decline Taguri's invitation to come again. Kazuya finds Kiriha lying on the table, munching on rice crackers and watching TV. He suggests they watch baseball, but Kiriha's scary look makes him listen to the game on the radio instead. Kasumi turns off the TV and looks annoyed at her behavior. When Kiriha tries to take the remote from Kasumi, she fails and gets pointed towards Kyukuri, who is diligently washing dishes. Kasumi praises Kyukuri's hard work and encourages Kiriha to do the same. At first, Kiriha refuses, but she changes her mind when Kasumi threatens to withhold her beloved pudding. Kasumi assigns Kiriha the task of peeling potatoes, and Kazuya is asked to buy pork cutlet sauce since they've run out. Together, Kiriha and Kyukuri finish preparing the vegetables. As they head to the grocery store, Kiriha and Kyukuri have some playful fun while shopping, but Kazuya keeps them focused on the shopping list. They get excited by the variety of snacks, but he reminds them to stick to the list. They find all the items and Kyukuri imagines being with Kazuya as she sees a loving family, something we can't relate to. Kiriha fills Kazuya's basket with pudding, but he and Kyukuri return the extras, making Kiriha cry. In an attempt to cheer her up, Kazuya gives her one cup of pudding. Kyukuri wants Mizuyakin but decides not to get it. At the checkout, they encounter a long line at Kokayu's register, and Shiru and some customers stare at her chest. Back home, they enjoy dinner together. After the meal, Kiriha eagerly looks forward to her pudding, and Kyukuri helps clean the table. Kazuya brings Kiriha the sweet red bean jelly from the shopping list, and they both enjoy their desserts happily. Later in the bath, Kazuya is surrounded by Kazumi, Kyukuri, Chisato, Kiriha, and Kokayu, trying to relax and remember the events that led them to this amusing situation. Earlier that day at school, they witnessed Shiru being surrounded by adoring girls, making him unusually popular. Chisato, Osamu, and Kazuya suspect something unnatural is at play. Kazuya uses Kiriha's powers to protect his friends from the obsessed classmates. They manage to escape to another classroom, but their pursuers continue to follow them. On the school rooftop, Shiru explains that he used an Amasogi bottle to try and make Misako like him. 
Kiriha warns Chisato to stay away from it. Kazuya advises Shiru to take responsibility and destroy the bottle himself. After some emotional struggle, Shiru throws the bottle to the ground, but it doesn't break. The bottle leaks and its contents spill over Kazuya, leading to a comedic and chaotic situation. It's not fair! When Kazuya returns home, he finds himself running from a group of females, including his family members. After Kazumi joins him in the bath and everyone starts crowding around him, Kazuya feels overwhelmed and manages to resolve the situation on his own. The next day, Shiru experiences a curse backlash that emits a foul smell, causing everyone to avoid him. In the past, Sakumi Miratsuki witnessed someone committing by jumping from the school roof, leaving behind a pair of shoes and a letter. At the Hakusen Shrine, Kazuya trains with Kyukuri while Kiriha challenges him. Kyukuri wins the challenge, and Kiriha becomes angry at Kazuya for not performing well, pushing him to train harder. At school, Kazuya feels exhausted due to Kiriha overworking him. They, along with Chisato, are summoned to the student council office by Tadetika Tadeta. However, before they can enter, a loud crash from outside startles them. Tadetika's wig falls off, revealing his bald head. But he quickly puts it back on and apologizes, asking them to take a seat. Tadetika explains that some students from class 1 minus 5 have claimed to see Aiko Nago, who passed away two years ago. He wants them to investigate the matter. Kiriha dismisses the idea of ghosts and suggests it's likely an Amasogi causing these sightings. The group begins their investigation into Aiko's incident and they discover that a student from the newspaper club is also looking into it. Tadetika recommends interviewing two members of the newspaper club, Yuichi and Nanako. They meet Nanako from the newspaper club and witness a ghost-like figure of Aiko asking for the letter. Kazuya tries to capture it, but fails, upsetting Kiriha. Nanako, on the other hand, is excited about their supernatural abilities. They take Yu, a member of the newspaper club, to the nurse's office for rest and to interview her. Kiriha identifies the Amasogi as a dangerous Kamiani that needs to be exercised. Yu reveals that Aiko was part of a fan club, and conflicts arose when Yuichi showed interest in her. Yu believes that Aiko was bullied by Muratsuki and others, and that Muratsuki was the first to find Aiko's body. The group learns that Aiko's sister has enrolled in the school under a different name, and they rush to the scene. Kazuya uses Obai wheels to reach there quickly. Nanako is attacked by the Amasogi, but Kazuya manages to save her and reveals her true identity as Aiko's sister, Nanako Nago. Nanako admits that she hoped the Amasoga's manifestation could help uncover the truth behind her sister's death. Kiria questions Nanako's explanation about the Amasogi, and Kazuya asks about the letter. Nanako clarifies that the letter is the only thing the Amasogi mentioned. Nanako confronts Muratsuki about the letter, and she admits to bullying Aiko after Aiko distanced herself from Yuichi. On the day of Aiko's death, she expressed anger and went to the rooftop, where Muratsuki found her shoes and suicide note. Out of fear, Muratsuki kept the letter hidden. Kazuya asks Muratsuki to bring them the letter, and Nanako reads Aiko's suicide note about a controlling growth. Nanako blames herself, and the Amasogi attacks. Kazuya and Kiriha defend themselves, but Kazuya struggles to harm it. They decide to work together to destroy the Amasogi, and with Kiriha's guidance, Kazuya succeeds in using Spiral Weave to defeat it. Nanako cries for her sister, but Kiriha explains that Aiko suppressed her negative emotions to protect Nanako. Kiriha advises Nanako not to wish for her own death, as it would make Aiko's sacrifice in vain, and Nanako accepts this advice. Kiriha scolds Kazuya for disobeying and Osamu, Tadetika, and Chisato arrive at the scene while Kiriha punishes Kazuya. Meanwhile, Sanao Sumeragi and Kotsu observe everything from the trees. After using Flames of Heaven to protect Sanao and Kotsu, Hanoka accepts Sanao as an exorcist, and they part ways on good terms. Back at the student council office, Tadetika discusses Nanako's Amasogi situation with Osamu, Chisato, Kiriha, and Kazuya. They are relieved that there was no immediate curse backlash, but Nanako enters the room, unable to speak due to the delayed effects of the curse. Kiriha explains that the curse backlash doesn't always manifest right away. Kazuya apologizes to Nanako, but she insists on taking responsibility, supported by Kiriha. Kiriha then leaves, and Nanako reassures Kazuya that Kiriha is right. As Kazuya prepares to go home, he shares his concern with Kiriha, saying that she was too harsh on Nanako. However, Kiriha tells him to be silent. Suddenly, Kazuya is confronted by Sanao, who unexpectedly punches him in the face and continues to attack him. Kiriha intervenes to defend Kazuya, but she gets overpowered by Sanao. Kotsu also interferes, but Sanao reverts him to his weapon form. 
Kiriha wonders if Sanao is possessed by Atsuki Megami, but he denies it. Sanao reveals her true self and attacks Kazuya, believing that he isn't suitable to replace her deceased brother, Suu. As Sanao challenges Kazuya to prove himself as an exorcist, Kiriha recognizes her and suggests they all go to the land god for assistance. They head to Kazuya's house, where Kyukuri makes a grand entrance, leading to a playful confrontation between her and Kiriha. Sanao and Kotsu are surprised by Kiriha's bold behavior towards a god. Sanao and Kotsu observe Kazuya's fight with the Kamiani and had doubts about his ability to wield Kanaka's weapon. They consulted with Kyukuri, who agreed to let Sanao test Kazuya's strength. Sanao thanked Kyukuri, but Kiriha was displeased with the whole situation. Sanao challenged Kazuya to a duel to decide the region's exorcist. At Tsu Sumaraga's funeral, Hanoka refused Sanao's request for Atsuki Megami to seek revenge for her brothers. Hanoka scolded Sanao for seeking vengeance and reminded her of Tsu's wish for a peaceful life as an exorcist. However, Sana was determined to take matters into her own hands and blamed herself for Siu's death. As the story unfolds, Sana repeatedly duels with Kanaka in her quest for vengeance, but Kanaka easily defeats her every time. Sana confronts Kazuya, challenging his worthiness to replace Kanaka. Kiriha accepts the challenge on his behalf, but Kazuya remains silent. Eventually, Kazuya expresses guilt over the events involving Tadetika and Nanako due to his curse attraction. He contemplates giving up his role as an exorcist and suggests Sanao take his place. Kiriha takes drastic measures to comfort Kazuya, removing their clothes to offer physical comfort. She reassures Kazuya, confesses that she would be lonely without him, and encourages him not to give up. In the end, Kazuya accepts his role as an exorcist and becomes more emotionally mature. Kiriha experiences a sudden growth spurt, but she clarifies that it is actually Kazuya who has grown emotionally. As they discuss Sanao's revelation from the previous day, Kazuya expresses his determination not to give up. The scene becomes more playful as Kiriha offers Kazuya a reward if he wins. However, they are interrupted by Kyukuri and Kasumi, who walk in, shocked by the situation and drag Kiriha away, resulting in playful arguments. Kiriha and Kazuya train under a bridge while Kokayu, Kyukuri, and Chisato Chikeshi watch from a distance. Kiriha explains to Kazuya the range of their attacks and how they might face a disadvantage against a sword-wielding opponent. However, she assures him they have a plan in place. Meanwhile, Sanao trains with Hanoka, thanking her for the sparring session and expressing confidence in her abilities. Kotsu interrupts their conversation, but Sanao asks her to wait and continues talking with Hanoka. The topic shifts to Kazuya, and Kotsu mentions that he must have passed Kyukuri's qualification test. Sanao scolds Kotsu for being arrogant and dismisses her opinions. Later, Kiriha and Kazuya take a bath together and discuss their upcoming duel. Kyukuri had provided them with water dolls to use during the fight, meant to redirect any damage away from the fighters and onto the dolls. However, only Kiriha and Sanao are protected by these dolls. Kira reveals her ability to create duplicates of her obai, but if the real one is damaged, it takes time to regenerate. She encourages Kazuya not to hesitate to use her real body if needed. As Kazuya dries her hair, he promises to protect her. Kiriha becomes shy and playfully pokes Kazuya, teasingly telling him to be careful with her. In a dream, Kazuya talks to his mother's spirit, Kanaka, and wonders why Kiriha got mad. Kanaka explains that Kiriha is used to protecting others, not being protected herself. The dream includes funny and awkward moments with Kiriha, Kyukuri, Chisato, Kokayu, and Kasumi, making Kazuya feel uncomfortable. Kanaka teases him playfully. As the dream ends and the sun rises, Kazuya and Kanaka bid farewell. Kazuya tries to uncover the connection between the previous exorcist and his mother, suspecting they might be the same person. However, Kanaka informs him that his memory is still sealed, preventing him from making that connection. He wakes up and checks his pants, relieved it was all just a dream. At the Hakusen Shrine, Kazuya and Sanao connect to Kyukuri's water dolls for their duel. Sanao doubts Kazuya's worthiness as Kanaka's successor, while Kazuya feels responsible for attracting curses and notices how Sanao treats Kotsu. The duel begins with Kazuya displaying a new technique called the doll weave. Sanao quickly destroys it, leading to a back and forth battle between them. Throughout the intense fight, both fighters showcase their skills and strategies. Kyukuri proudly informs Hinoka that Kazuya is winning, but Sanao surprises him with a powerful attack. The fight remains intense as they continue exchanging attacks and countering each other's moves. During the intense battle, Sanao launches her attacks, but Kazuya defends himself using the watershed weave. He counterattacks, managing to hurt Sanao. Kotsu warns Sanao to save her energy, but she doesn't listen and continues fighting. Both fighters pause briefly to plan their next moves. Anoka observes the fight, believing Kazuya will win if they keep stalling. 
Kyukuri asks about Sanaa's technique that she used to pass her test, and Hanoka explains that it works best at close range. However, Hanoka thinks Sana won't be able to get close to Kazuya, while Kyukuri disagrees. Kazuya is determined to defeat Sana at her full strength to prove that Tsukimagami are more than just tools. He charges at Sana, and Hanoka thinks about Kotsu's help in using Sana's secret technique, Hibakiri. Kazuya activates Ascension, surprising Hanoka, and uses Muscle Enhancing Weave to block Sunao's attacks. Kyukuri thinks they are evenly matched, but Hanoka disagrees. Kazuya catches Kotsu, breaking its handle, and successfully finishes off Sunao with a move called Coiling Snake, securing his victory in the battle. After the fight, Kazuya returns to his normal state after deactivating Ascension. Kiria playfully taps him on the butt to congratulate him, and Kyukuri also congratulates Kazuya. Sanao picks up Kotsu's blade, and Hanoka explains the damage to the Tsukimagami but reminds Sanao to be grateful since Kazuya could have destroyed Kotsu entirely. Sanao shows respect to the Kamioka residents and leaves with Hanoka. However, Kazuya collapses from exhaustion after the battle. Back in Kazuya's room, Kyukuri and Kiria discuss the side effects of Ascension. Kasumi calls them to dinner, and during the meal, Kazuya is unable to move his lower body due to the after-effects of Ascension. Kiriha assures Kasumi that it's temporary, but Kasumi has some amusing fantasies about taking care of Kazuya. Kiriha playfully teases Kyukuri, making her embarrassed. Kiriha suggests Kyukuri help Kazuya bathe, and although Kyukuri is initially hesitant, she decides to do it to support Kazuya as he's an exorcist. They handle the situation delicately, and Kazuya feels emotional during the process. The next morning, Kyukuri wakes up and finds Kazuya and Kiriha sleeping together she screams, Kiriha gets upset and binds Kyukuri for screaming so early. Kazuya realizes that their energy is back. Kasumi rushes in and yells at Kiriha for her behavior. Kazuya plans to go to school with Kiriha, but she asks him to go alone. As Kazuya leaves, Kiriha discusses preparations with Kyukuri and Kokayu. At the Sumeragi estate, Sanao's mother criticizes her for her actions, and Suzuri informs Sanao that she can't inherit the dojo after losing. Their only option is to either defeat the person who defeated them or marry him to inherit the dojo. Meanwhile, at Kamioka East Middle School, Nanako confronts Nakajima about his supernatural issues, but he attempts to deny it. Kazuya witnesses Tatami scolding Hiroshi while he walks to his next class. Now Kazuya, chilling with some fuzzy dreams about his past trying to figure out his life purpose and life like yourself. Suddenly, the lady he thought was his mom gets whacked with a freaking long pipe. Dude's freaking out, then he wakes up to find Kiriha, Kyukuri, and Kokayu all crashed in his bed on top of him. Kazuya pushes them off and explains that it is too hot to sleep like that. Moreover, Kazuya sees that Kiriha has once again decided not to wear any undergarments, leading Kazuya to scold her. In response, Kiriha mentions that it wasn't on purpose. As Kiriha tries to return to sleep with Kazuya, Kasumi barges into their room, begins yelling at Kiriha for sleeping with Kazuya. Before Kasumi can launch a pan of fried eggs at Kiriha, Kazuya stops her and Kasumi warns him he is going to be late for school. Kazuya quickly gets dressed and reminds Kiriha what they have to do at school. At school, Kazuya's friends speak to him while his classmates ask Kiriha various questions. Stuff begins to get real, when Kiriha spills the beans about living with Kazuya and how they're always sharing a freaking bath and hitting the sack together. This sets off Shiru Shuramine, who decides to play judge and jury in a mock trial during class, laying down the law and finding Kazuya guilty as hell and his punishment, some messed up turtle shell bondage pendulum mess. After class, Kazuya chops it up with Shiru, Chisato Chikeshi, and Osamu Asanai in a private spot, where Kiriha finally comes clean as Atsuki Megami. It's a mind-blowing revelation. Then Kazuya drops the bomb that he wants to start a club to handle all the crazy mess paranormal mess going down around the school. They explain the existence of aberrations, curses and that Kazuya himself is a taboo child. Kazuya's friends agree to join and form the club. Tadidika Tadida and Nanako Nanakai arrive to pledge their support as well, revealing that they have slowly been recovering from their curse backlash. The group holds their first meeting and begins discussing if anyone is aware of anything of note that has happened recently. Chisato, Nanako and Tadidika reveal that there have been cases of underwear going missing after swimming classes. At night, as Chisato sleeps in her room, she dreams of Kazuya, while Azami and Mimain Miyu sneak into her room. Mimin rummages through Chisato's wardrobe and confirms what they were looking for has disappeared as planned. The next day at school during swim class, Shiru leers as girls in their swimsuits. He rolls up, and Kazuya's like, yo, where'd your glasses go? 
and Chisato's all, oh snap, must have left him somewhere. She heads back to the locker room, only to find their clothes scattered all over the dang place. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she spots some freaky creature booking it through the vents like it's on a mission. Kazuya rounds up the crew to hash out Chisato's freaky encounter. Kiriha's like, yeah, definitely sounds like some Amasogi shenanigans. Shiryu's all, we need bait to lure that sucker out, and straight up demands Chisato's and Nanako's undies. Chisato's not having any of it and straight up socks him one. Tadetika offers his own underwear, but Shiru rejects. Kiriha agrees with Shiru's plan and they end up using her underwear as bait, placing it in a box trap. They catch the culprit which they discover to be a pair of panties with an animated frog cartoon on it. Kazuya recognizes the underwear as Chisato's but she denies it, prompting the underwear to flee to the school roof. Kiria and Kazuya quickly catch up to it where the Amasogi gathers curse and transforms into a giant frog monster. Kazuya and Kiriha battle it but are unable to damage the frog. Chisato, Shiru and Osamu arrive at the rooftop where Kazuya once again asks if the underwear belonged to her. They tell Chisato that she needs to admit the underwear is hers and her desire for underwear gave birth to the Amasogi. Yes, a pair of underwear somehow gave birth, I just can't make that up. Chisato reluctantly admits the underwear is hers, but denies having such a desire which they realize would have been odd. Kazuya and Kiriha defeat the frog monster and it reverts back to its underwear form. Chisato tells them that though the underwear is hers, they had been put away for a long time. Kiriha tells Kazuya to strip, and Kazuya takes off his boxers. They give the boxers to the Amasogi, who Kiriha deduces was lonely from being discarded and unused. The pieces of underwear float up to the sky into a beam of light which can be viewed from across town. Kiriha tells Chisato this was the best outcome for the underwear and she agrees. The group stands triumphantly, aside from Kazuya, who remains without underwear and covers himself in embarrassment. Those undies just keep flying up into the freaking sky, ending up in space where some astronaut spots it. Later that night, Asamu's on TV getting grilled about that weird beam of light, while Kokayu straight up inhaling mad amounts of grub. Meanwhile, Kazuya and Kiria are chilling in the tub, talking about Chisato's undies acting all funky, like some regular Amasogi or Tsugumomo. Meanwhile, Kasumi's freaking out doing clothes, trying to figure out where Kazuya's undies vanished to. She's straight up convinced he sold them or something shady. At school, Yasuki's shooting the breeze with Mimane, Arumi, and Akito Ashimine plotting for the next showdown with those freaky aberrations. Kazuya tells Kyukuri of a dream he had of Kiriha and a woman with a black obai. Kyukuri realizes Kazuya's sealed memories returning and wonders what could be the reason for such a thing since those memories were supposed to be sealed away. Suddenly, the realization hits and Kyukuri establishes that it must be a side effect of Kazuya using Ascension, and tells herself she will warn Kiriha about using it later. Kyukuri is all curious and asks Kazuya what went down next in his dream. And Kazuya's like, bruh, that's where the dream straight up dropped the mic and peaced out. However, Kazuya also mentions that something about the lady with the black obai felt really familiar. Kiriha then arrives at the Sumeragi residence's front door, but no one answers her. Sunao suddenly is launched out of her house, through the walls at the side of the door. Kiriha checks to see if Sunao is okay and meets Suzumu Sumeragi who begins to cry over Sunao, worrying if she is okay. Emerging from the broken wall, Suzuri Sumeragi tells her husband not to coddle Sunao. Sunao gets up to continue her duel with her mother and is promptly defeated. Kiriha meets with Sunao in her home where Sunao apologizes for the trouble she has caused her and Kazuya. Sunao tells Kiriha that Kotsu is undergoing repairs and they are both glad he is alright. Sunao asks how Kanaka died and Kiriha tells Sunao that she eliminated Kanaka after she became possessed. Kazuya arrives at the Sumeragi residence, amazed at its grandeur. So, Kazuya is strolling up, feeling all brave and whatnot but then he's hit with this total death vibe, like, whoa, bro, what's up with that? Little does he know, Suzumu's lurking on the other side of the door, ready to go full ninja mode on him for messing with Sunao. But then, out of nowhere, Suzuri swoops in and takes care of Suzumu like it's no biggie, and suddenly, that creepy aura just vanishes into thin air. After giving the two some tea, Suzuri leaves the two alone and closes the shoji. Sunao apologizes to Kazuya for her previous actions and thanks him for helping her realize what is important to her. Kazuya tells Sunao that she is very honest with her feelings, his words reminding Sunao of her brother. Sunao asks Kazuya out, explaining that she is unable to the Sumeragi Dojo since Kazuya defeated her in combat unless he marries her. Sanao begs Kazuya before threatening him when Suzuri suddenly returns. Suzuri opens the shoji to find the two acting like a romantic couple. 
The two attempt to reaffirm themselves as a couple to Suzuri, but Suzuri tests them by having the two bathe together. Twenty years ago, Suzuri defeated all of her sparring opponents and left to take a bath. Her opponents talk about the rule where if one could land a hit on her they would be married into her family, and about Suzumu doing cleaning due to his poor skills. Suzuri enters the bathroom naked to find Suzumu still cleaning. As Suzuri is about to hit Suzumu, the two slip and Suzumu accidentally hits her with his mop. Suzuri tells Suzumu that he has to take responsibility and marry her, and he will be trained into a man befitting the Sumeragi Dojo. Back in the present, Suzuri has Sunao and Kazuya bathe together to prove their love for each other. Suzumu hides within the bath waters, waiting for the time to strike Kazuya. As the two enter the bath, Suzumu strikes, but accidentally hits Sunao instead. Suzuri again disposes of Suzumu, leaving the bath bloody and unusable. Continuing their test, Suzuri has the two sleep together as a couple, nude. Suzuri waits outside for the two to finish. Sunao brings Kazuya under the sheets and the two pretend to have sex. While pretending to be intimate with each other, Sunao becomes infatuated with Kazuya. Suzumu barges into the room and attacks again, accidentally canchoing Sunao instead of Kazuya. Before he can attack Kazuya, he is disposed of by Suzuri again. Suzuri tells them to continue, but they tell her they have already finished, pointing out a blood stain on their futon. Suzuri inspects the blood spot and then Sunao's hymen to find it still intact discovering the blood to be from Sunao's finger. As punishment for attempting to deceive her, Suzuri brings Sunao and Kazuya to a room full of torture equipment. After their punishment is complete, Sunao escorts Kazuya off their premises as Suzuri and Suzumu see them off. Suzumu tells Suzuri she went too far with her actions, forcing them to get married simply because she lost. Suzuri replies stating the way Sunao described her duel with Kazuya gave her a good impression of him. Suzumu finally catches on that Sunao's totally crushing on Kazuya and goes all ballistic, but Suzuri's like, hold up, bro, no need for violence. Sunao's all smooth, telling Kazuya they gotta keep up the charade and train together to keep up appearances as a couple. Kazuya's like, um, pretty sure everyone already knows we're faking it, but Sunao's not having it and straight up smacks him, claiming the lies still on. Then, Sunao starts spilling about their little rendezvous in bed, wondering if it meant something or if Kazuya's just dense as a brick. Turns out, Kazuya's clueless, thinking it was all an act. Ouch. Later that night, Sunao's tossing and turning in her futon, feeling all sorts of embarrassed. Fukuri's out there busting curses left and right around Kamioka, doing her thing like a boss from Hakusen Shrine. Kokayu swings by with some tea, but Kyukuri straight up collapses from all the hardcore cleansing. Meanwhile, at school, Kiriha spills the tea to Kazuya about Kyukuri's collapse, telling him he's gotta keep slaying those exorcist duties to help ease her load. Cut to track and field practice, and Mitsuri's straight up crushing it, beating all her previous records. Teacher's all proud, patting her on the noggin like she's some kind of track star prodigy. Mana Manaka pulls Mitsuri away and tells their teacher not to bother her like that. Mana then congratulates Mitsuri and Mitsuri thinks to herself how Mana has always kept her motivated. Akito Ashimin watches the two in the background and grins. At the personal advice club, go through various requests and concerns they have received. They find nothing of concern aside from numerous complaints about Shiru's behavior. Shiru claims he has standards, only hitting on girls with large breasts, which Chisato beats him for. Later, Shiru heads to the meeting point atop the school roof only to find Mitsuri there instead with his letter, then realizing he had put his letter in the wrong locker. Mitsuri asks if Shiru is serious about the letter, expressing her self-doubts when compared to someone like Mana. Shiru panics and attempts to comfort Mitsuri, telling her that she is cuter. Mitsuri is flustered by his statement and fails to hear Shiru explain that his letter was meant for someone else. She accepts Shiru as her boyfriend and leaves before Shiru can say anything else. Later that night, Mitsuri thinks to herself how fortunate she is to have beaten Mana in both running and getting a boyfriend first. The next day at school, the other students are shocked that Shiru has a girlfriend, watching the two walk together with their arms together. Shiru's like, yo, Mitsuri, maybe we should dial down the PDA a bit. But Mitsuri's all, nah, I'm good, totally brushing off his request like it's nothing. Meanwhile, Kazuya, Kiriha, Chisato, and Osamu are straight up lurking from a distance, watching the whole scene unfold like some juicy drama series. They're all like, dang, what's the deal with those two? And then, you got the other students chiming in, gossiping about how Shiru's bound to be a total player, and cheat on Mitsuri eventually. Drama's off the charts, man. Mana confronts Mitsuri and Shiru, telling Mitsuri they should break up and warning her of Shiru's lecherous nature. Mitsuri writes off Mana's comments as jealousy and Mana leaves. At a date atop the school, Shiru tells Mana that he had always put himself out for girls of his type, earning himself a bad reputation and low popularity. Shiru finally confesses that the love letter Mitsuri received was meant for Mana and apologizes. Mitsuri denies his claim and begins hitting him on the chest, causing his Heizakura to fall out. 
The Heizakura begins to shake and Shiru realizes that Mitsuri has an Amasogi in her back. Shiru asks Mitsuri if she had come across any objects with strange powers. Mitsuri denies it, but Shiru can tell she is lying, and warns her of its dangers. She continues denying it, crying as she runs away with her back. Shiru informs the other members of the club that Mitsuri had an Amasogi. Asamu reads one of their earlier requests, realizing it was from Mitsuri. They decide to confront Mitsuri outside of Mana's house where Kazuya gives his deduction that Mitsuri is trying to eliminate Mana so she will not lose to her. Mitsuri laughs at Kazuya for being completely wrong and Kiriha stomps his crotch in for it. Mana exits her house to see what the commotion is about. Mitsuri returns the shoes to Mana, explaining how she was grateful for the gift and used them every day which only worsened her abilities. She explains that when she wore a different pair of shoes her performance improved. And with Shiru's explanation of Amasogi, deduced that Mana had given her the shoes to hinder her abilities. Believing that Mitsuri will never love her and instead hate her for what she has done, Mana dons the shoes to eliminate Mitsuri instead. Kazuya and Kiriha protect Mitsuri and attempt to flee with her using Obai wheels, but Mana easily gains on them using her Amasogi. They attempt to battle Mana, however Kazuya and Kiriha are quickly overpowered and Kazuya suggests they use Ascension, which Kiriha rejects stating it is a last resort. Mitsuri interrupts their fight, calling out to Mana and kissing her. Mitsuri yells at Mana for giving up so easily and not even attempting to apologize. The two make amends but Mana becomes possessed by the Amasogi. Before being fully taken over, Mana warns Mitsuri to flee. Kazuya carries Mitsuri on her back as they try to evade Mana. With no other choice, Kazuya and Kriya use Ascension and successfully destroy the shoes. At school, Shiru straight up shook when he found out Mana was the host for the Amasobi. Mana rolls in, rocking a wheelchair, dropping the truth that she lost her walking mojo soon after she bounced back home. Meanwhile, the squad's all thrown for a loop by Mitsuri's sudden makeover. On the flip side, Shiru's trying to shoot his shot with Mitsuri for real, but yeah, he basically got rejected like ourselves. In the midst of all this, Kiriha's putting her detective hat on, thinking there's more to this whole Amasogi situation than meets the eye. Something's definitely fishy and she's gonna get to the bottom of it. Kazumi wakes up to Kirio rubbing her breasts and screams. Kazumi rushes to Kazumi's room to punish Kirio. At school, Kazumi and Kirio meet with their friends Shiton Shuramin, Asane Asanai, and Chikao Chikeshi. Kazumi notes something feels strange, to which Kirio suggests that she forgot her underwires and lifts her skirt. While Chikao beats Kirio for her perversion, Asane opens her notebook and instantly remembers they are in a dream. A few days earlier, Isuzu Iraha attended the very empty classroom. Isuzu leaves to consult with the other teachers on what to do, leaving the class alone. Shiru drops bombs about rumors of some missing students getting wrecked by this freaky sleep sickness. Kiriha's on it though, rallying the squad and pulling some strings to get a class advisor for the club. Shiru's mind's running wild, thinking it's gonna be some hottie, but nope, it's f***ing Kyukuri. So, they roll up to the crib of the first victim of this sleep sickness nightmare, ready to dig deep and uncover the truth. Kyukuri attributes the phenomena to be caused by a pillow Tsukimagami, but upon inspecting the victim's pillow with her Heizakura, there is no response. After investigating, Investigating the first three victims to no avail, they return to the club room to continue the discussion. Shiru comments on the three victims as being friends and frequently causing trouble. Looking for clues about the three of them, Kazuya realizes they were marked as sick instead of absent despite their parents never phoning in about it. Kazuya confronts their teacher Isuzu about this, but Isuzu retreats into her dream world and falls asleep. She is brought to her home where they identify her pillow as the Amasogi, being unable to destroy the pillow due to it entrapping the students within the dream world. Kyukuri invites the pillow Tsugumomo Bakura to help them enter the dream and convince Isuzu to destroy the Amasogi from within. Bakura explains how the dream world works to them, sending Kazuya, Kiriha, Chisato, Asamu and Shiru inside. Shiru writes a message in his sketchbook to help them realize they are in the dream once they enter. Tadetika decides to stay in the real world, because his disgusting ass said you've got me messed up. Within the dream world, after realizing they are in a dream, Kazuya and Kiriha go to confront Isuzu. They plead with Isuzu to leave the dream and destroy the pillow, but she dons a monstrous grin. She reveals that had planned for their arrival, and the pillow they had stolen in advance was a fake. Behind the corner, the fake pillow Shiru, Chisato and Osamu had recovered burst into flames. The four burst through the school building to the outside as they began to fight. Chisato, Osamu and Shiru watch from the destroyed wall, but are suddenly surrounded by the shadows of other students and soon their own. Isuzu then orders the shadows to attack, but a cloud of chalk dust appears and the three escape. 
As Kazuya and Kiriha do battle with their shadow selves, they find themselves being overpowered as they are able to create more Obai projections. Shadow Kazuya attacks Kazuya and slowly begins to take him over. Shisato, Asamu and Shiru escape to a classroom with the help of a girl who reveals herself to be the real Isuzu. Isuzu explains her situation of how her students never took her seriously, and how she eventually stumbled upon the pillow. Within her dreams she could be as assertive as she wanted. But in reality nothing changed, and over students ended up being dragged into her dreams without her realizing it, which she suspects was her shadow's plan. Isuzu reveals that her shadow has the pillow but with Kazuya busy, they have no way of obtaining it. Asamu tells them he has an idea. Isuzu confronts her shadow self, landing a surprise attack on it. She identifies the pillow to be within its body but is quickly restrained by other shadows before she can get it. Shadow Isuzu uses the paper to transform herself into a giant spider. Before Shadow Kazuya can take over, he breaks free. Kazuya and his shadow self have a final clash using spiral weaves and Kazuya defeats his shadow. Shadow Isuzu strikes at Isuzu in its giant spider form but is hit by Chisato's library golem, and then by Asamu's sketchbook dragon, while Shiru uses his perfume to lure the shadow students away from Isuzu. The shadow covers Asamu and Chisato in webs, but they are quickly freed by Kazuya who saves them from the spider after rescuing Shiru first. Kazuya flips the spider over and restrains it, allowing Isuzu to finish it off and destroy the pillow. With their work done, Bakura messages them all to return to sleep in the dream world in order to wake up in reality. The next day at school, Kazuya and Kiriha comment on Isuzu having grown more assertive. Prior to exiting the dream world, Shiru checks out his own gender-swapped body but fails to get turned on by it. Asamu reasons since they are currently female they would be attracted to males instead. Shiru argues he is simply not attracted to himself, disproving Asamu's argument playing and getting aroused by Asane's body instead. Kazuya and Kiriha lounge around in their room reading manga when the doorbell suddenly rings. Answering the door, Kazuya is met with a distraught Sanao. Sanao informs Kazuya, Kiriya and Kyukuri that Kotsu has been unable to wake up since being repaired, and that Hinoka advised her to seek out the Echo Stone within the Cave of the Divine Navel. She informs them that it is too dangerous for her to go by herself and Hinoka cannot follow her there, so she sought out Kazuya and Kiriha. The group quickly travels to their destination by train and rents a room in a large hotel. Thereupon, Kiriya turns to Sunao, telling her to stop sulking. Sunao tells them she was thinking about Kotsu and what she is going to say to him the next day after being mean to him for so long. Now, the trio's living it up, feasting like kings, with Kiriha straight up demanding Kazuya be her personal chef, feeding her like some sort of royalty. After chowing down, they head to bed, and Sunao's jaws hit the floor when she finds out Kazuya and Kiriha share a bed. Kazuya's all trying to be considerate, but Kiriha's like, nah, fam, she's clueless about Kotsu's vibes. Under the covers, Kazuya's all like, we gotta be more chill with Sunao, but Kiriha's not having it, laying down the truth that Sunao's still in the dark about Kotsu's feels and won't be able to bring him back anytime soon. Kiriha reveals that she, Kyukiri and Hinoka all know why Kotsu has not reawakened but needs to have Sunao realize herself, and continues to play around with Kazuya to help her do so. That night, Sunao dreams of herself having a conversation with Kotsu. Sunao tries to speak to Kotsu but all he does is apologize, and Sunao awakes from her dream before she can reach out to him. She looks around to see Kiriya and Kazuya sleeping together, and then takes out Kotsu to examine him and reflect. The next day, the three walk through a forest and reach the cave. Entering the cave, they eventually reach a large room with a giant stone tablet. Sunao places Kotsu on the Echo Stone and prays for him to wake up. A large plant-like bulb appears from the blade, with Kotsu sleeping in his human form inside. Sunao calls out to Kotsu, begins apologizing and begging him to wake up. Numerous emisogi appear around them, which Sunao recognizes as those she and Kotsu defeated in the past. Kiriha deduces they are manifestations of Kotsu's self-doubt and tells Sunao to continue calling out to Kotsu while she and Kazuya defend them. Sunao continues calling out to him, apologizing to no avail and pondering what it is he wants. Kotsu reflects on his past failures, believing even if he were to awaken, Sunao would tell him he is not needed. A manifestation of Su Sumeragi appears in Kotsu's mind, telling him that doubt will dull his blade as a katana and that he should focus on what he wants most. The aberration that eliminated Su manifests amongst the Amasogi defeats Kazuya. It begins devouring the orb that Kotsu is encased in. Sunao attempts to run towards it, but Kazuya stops her and suggests to Kiriya they use Ascension. Kiriya rejects, stating if they were unable to defeat it before Ascension wore off, they would all die. 
The monster swallows Kotsu and Sunao breaks down into tears. Sunao gets up as both they simultaneously realize what they wanted was to be with each other. Kotsu bursts out of the aberration's mouth from a beam of light and is reawakened. Sunao and Kotsu cry and they apologize and hold each other. Kazuya cries too watching the two reconcile. The aberration attacks Sunao and Kotsu but is instantly defeated as the two use ascension to destroy it. Returning to the hotel, Kazuya continues crying tears of joy for the two which Kiraha hits him for. Sunao lies immobile on the floor, unaware of the side effects of ascension which they explain to her and Kotsu. Kazuya and Kotsu are blindfolded as they help Sunao bathe while Kiraha watches. Returning home, Sunao and Kotsu thank Kyukuri for her help. Kiriha tells him that the entire commotion was caused by the thought of Atsugumomo not being wanted by their owners and that they are quite emotional. He reassures Kiriha that he wishes to be with her forever, causing her to blush. Sano continues thanking Kyukuri, thanking her for paying for their stay which Kyukuri is confused by. Kokayu comes to tell Kyukuri that Tagiri has come to visit her. Tagiri states she has come to collect Kyukuri as promised, which further confuses her. Kiriha gives the go-ahead and Tagiri drags Kyukuri away. Kazuya realizes that Tagiri had paid for their expenses which Kiraha reveals she had traded Kyukuri away for three days in exchange. Isuzu Iriha speaks with the Personal Advice Club, telling them that her Amasogi pillow was given to her but she cannot recall by whom, but thinks that it must have been given by some student. Kazuya then questions if they think that someone is trying to cause trouble and Kiriha believes that it is most likely the reason. Kiriga sheds some light on the way the Shu Amasogi went berserk and the matter of the underpants Amasogi. Furthermore, Kiriha believes that it all seems a little too convenient to be simple malice and disturbances. The group suspect that the recent Amasogi accidents were caused deliberately but wonder why. Kiriha suggests that they stay on their guard from now on. Mimin Miu rocks back and forth in her chair, complaining about being bored. Yasuki even asks Mimin to quiet down, but she mentions that things were starting to get fun because of that pillow. Mimin blames Kazuya Kagami and Kiriha for destroying the previous Amasogi and exclaims her desire to take them out. Nikito Ashimin rejects Mimin, reminding her that they promise not to. Mimin says she will eliminate the two herself, prompting Azami to attack them. Akito steps in, commanding the two to cut the crap and apologize to Azami. He promises to set Mimin straight. Azami lays down the law, reminding them of their deal and warns that time's running out, before ghosting out of there. Yasuki's skeptical as heck, dropping some serious expletives, questioning whether Azami can be trusted. But Akito's like, we're screwed either way. We gotta roll with it. He believes that this is all about getting their hands on that shard and if they can manage to do that, then they will be saved. Several hundred years ago in a certain house, Akito, Arumi and Hifumi all became Tsugumomo at the same time. As surrogate siblings, they made a deal with the master of the house to serve them, but on the condition they be treated as people as well. The master found the most use out of Hifumi and her ability to manipulate luck. They lived a good life for a while until monsters began attacking the village and Hifumi began to weaken. Hifumi told her siblings that the monsters were the result of their master abusing her powers. When Hifumi tried to stop their master, he threatened the well-being of Akito and Arumi, forcing Hifumi into compliance. When Akito and Arumi told the villagers of what their master was doing, they formed a mob, eliminating their master but Hifumi as well. They soon turned their weapons towards Akito and Arumi, leaving Akito no choice but to slay them all. The two sworn siblings would leave the village, wandering and shifting from one master to the next, eventually growing tired of serving anyone. One day, Akito and Arumi came across a red bull floating through a river. Upon snagging the bull, bam, a frickin' portal whisks them away to this freaky pocket dimension called Meoiga. As soon as they step foot in there, Yasuki's all up in their faces, firing off arrows like it's nobody's business. Negotiations off the table, so Akito's forced to throw down with Yasuki, guarding Arumi with everything he's got until Mimin swoops in, crashing the party out of pure curiosity. Next thing they know, they're face to face with Tanman, who gives them the official welcome to Meoiga and spills the beans about its whole deal. Akito and Arumi settle into this bizarre dimension. But Akito's mind's buzzing with questions that Tanman and the gang are keeping hush-hush about. It's peaceful, sure, but something's definitely off about this place. One day, two Tsugumomos reverted back to their original forms. It was then Tanman told Akito and Arumi the truth of Meoiga, of how their founder Miyurahi obtained the power to create Meoiga by eliminating a god stealing their stone shard to use as their own. He tells them that their current shard's power is waning and asks if they will aid Meoiga in eliminating a god to obtain a new one. After thinking it over, Akito and Arumi decide to join Meoiga in their hunt for a stone shard. Using Arumi's power of divination, they decided when was best to act. As time passed and more of them lost power, some Tsugumomo began to grow discontent on relying Arumi's divination. 
Genbu lead a protest at the gates of Meoiga but soon after, Arumi received a divination of a black mass. Akito, Arumi, Mimin, Yasuki and Chikage captured and brought it to Meoiga. There, the black mass revealed itself as Azami. Azami gave them information on which god was the most suitable target and how to weaken them further. Azami cooperated with them in exchange for them following her terms. Akito, Arumi, Mimin and Yasuki were sent to Kamioka to carry out Azami's plan. Back in the present, Akito reminds the other three that they need Azami's cooperation for their goals. From an alleyway, Azami spies on Kazuya and Kiriha going to an arcade. Sometime during their early days at Meoiga, Arumi took a bath with Mimain at their hot springs. There, Mimain teased Arumi about her and Akito being lovers and played with her breasts. Kiriha, Kazuya Kagami, Mimain Miyu and Akito Ashimin find themselves in a tournament arena as an announcer introduces the Iron Fist tournament. Mimin spots an Isle of Iron Man Fist arcade cabinets and jumps over it, landing atop Kazuya who is sitting beside Kiriha. Mimin greets Kiriha aloud, but neither she nor Kazuya notice her. Akito signals to Mimin and she tells them that she knows them from school. Before Akito can leave, Mimin calls over to him to play with them. However, out of nowhere, Kiriha starts blaring, and before they know it, they're sucked right into the freaking game's world, landing them smack dab in their current pickle. As they start plotting to take down the Amasoga's owner ASAP, boom, Hiroki Hirohashi pops out of the woodwork, revealing himself as the big shot hosting this wild tournament. The four put on a team and the tournament begins with Kiriha fighting first against her opponent, Daruman. Kiriha is quickly defeated due to her lack of understanding of fighting game mechanics. Shortly after, Akito enters the ring, telling Kazuya that he is familiar with the game. He easily defeats Daruman and forgoes penalizing the opponent with a costume change. Akito's next opponent reveals himself as the sword-wielding Kenshiro. Kiriha calls him out for cheating, but Hiroki explains weapons are allowed in the tournament. Akito blocks all Kenshiro's attacks by subtly transforming his arms into blades without Kazuya and Kiriha noticing. Once his meter is full, Akito disarms Kenshiro and deals a fatal blow, but is also defeated in the process, resulting in a draw. Both teams receive a penalty, resulting in Mimin getting dressed in a bunny suit, though Akito abstains from enforcing a penalty on the enemy. Mimin battles Namikawa in the next match of the tournament. Before beginning, Akito whispers to Mimin not to use her powers, which Mimin assures him she will not. As soon as their fight begins, she said forget this, and used her powers on his useless ass. Hiroki reveals himself as the final combatant of the opposing team. Mimin attempts to confuse and outmaneuver Hiroki, but is knocked out. Kazuya begins his final match of the tournament. Despite granting himself several power-ups, Hiroki is defeated by Kazuya. The five of them leave the arcade world as Hiroki agrees to destroy the Amasogi. Hiroki thanks Kazuya for helping him realize his desire for battle and leaves exclaiming he is going to travel the world. Azami angrily glares at him and Akito tries to signal to Mimin that they need to leave. Mimin misinterprets this and kisses Kazuya instead. How does that even work? I honestly have no idea. How? 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 I don't know! Azami accidentally destroys the ceiling which begins collapsing on her, but she is saved by Kazuya. He offers her a handkerchief to wipe her face and Azami calms down and blushes. Kiriha arrives to see what happened, but Azami has already disappeared before Kazuya can explain. Kiriha asks Mimain if she is a mirror Tsugumomo, which Mimain immediately confirms to Akito's dismay. Kiriha suggests the two of them be friends while Akito is forced to explain that he is Mimain's owner. Returning to the classroom at night, Akito explains what occurred to Yasuki and Arumi. Akito tells himself he needs to be more careful and avoid them as much as possible. The next day, they find themselves trapped by an Amasogi along with Kazuya. Akito introduces the two to Arumi as his sister. Wakana reveals herself as the Amasogi's owner and explains the rules of her game. The two pairs are forced to roll dice to progress and answer intimate questions as they do. Akito and Arumi are eventually separated from them. In the second round, Akito botches his answer about which part of Arumi's bod's the most sensitive, and Arumi straight up knocks him out cold before Wakana spills the beans. Then, for the final question, Wakana's like, who's the dude's deepest love? Kiriha jumps the gun, picking herself for Kazuya, but, surprise, it's dead wrong, shaking Kazuya like a ragdoll before they're booted back to square one. Meanwhile, Akito's deep in thought, trying to figure out who the heck he loves the most, when Arumi swoops in to save the day with the right answer. They're all zapped back to school, but Kiriha's not done playing her games, dropping hints about some juicy gossip she got from Mimin to blackmail Akito into joining their club. 
Later that night, Akito spills the beans to Yasuki and Mimane about joining Kazuya's crew. Back home, Kiriha's dishing to Kyukuri, Kasumi, and Kokayu about how she didn't win the prize for Kazuya's top squeeze. The trio's all antsy, thinking maybe they're the chosen ones. Kokayu's like, why don't we just ask Kazuya? But when Kazuya clams up, Bakura rolls in with a special knockout pillow to send him snoozing so they can dive into his dreams for answers. And what do they find? Kazuya getting flirty with a female version of himself. Kazuya recalls memories of his childhood when he created an Amasogi eraser and was scolded by his mother. He remembers his mother was an exorcist, but does not recognize her when speaking to her within his dream. Kanaka tells him it is because of the seal and leaves, telling Kazuya he needs to get ready. Kazuya is then awakened by Kiriha's foot landing on his face. Meanwhile, Kiriha explains that Akito and Mimin will deal with the Amasogi, but Akito believes that the two are not suitable for combat to which Kiriha suggests they test them out on an aberration currently active on the school campus. The group meets outside where a large spiked rock has made itself present. Kiriha teaches them a few more techniques, but they still fail to damage the rock. Shiru suggests they use breasts as the solution. Nimane goes ahead with Shiru's plan and strips naked while still in Kiriha's form, prompting Kiriha to hit Mimane. The owner of the rock does not respond, leading Mimane to copy Arumi's appearance and returns. The rock does not respond to Arumi's balloons either and Mimane suggests to her they both get undressed to double its effect. She tells Mimane useless self to get undressed herself and tears her clothes off. The Amasoga's host comes out to take a picture of Mimane and is then knocked out and has his phone destroyed. Later that night, Akito reports the day's activities to Yasuki. Yasuki expresses his concerns about Mimane's behavior only for Arumi, and Akito to realize she is not there with them. Meanwhile, Mimane barges into the bathroom of Kazuya's house while Kazuya and Kiriha are bathing. Mimane announces she is staying over, stating Akito wants to learn about Kazuya. Mimane asks to see Kazuya, causing a ruckus while Kyukuri and Kokayu stand atop the roof. Before she cleanses the town's accumulated curse, Kyukuri senses four Tsugumomo having entered the town. Next thing you know, Mimane's hauling Kyukuri's bathtub inside to warm her up. Mimane caresses Kyukuri in the bath and the two eventually get overheated from staying in too long. Kokayu returns home badly damaged, being carried by Taguri Kaneyama. After getting Kokayu a place to lie down, she explains her encounter with the four Tsugumomo that entered the town. When meeting them, Kokayu called them out on their suspicious behavior prompting them to attack her. Kokayu was quickly overpowered, but rescued by Taguri. He questions why Tsugumomo would attack them and they explain that the Tsugumomo is likely from Meoiga and are after Kyukuri's stone shard. Taguri states she was likely followed when carrying Kokayu back, making their location a target for attack once the assailants regroup. Taguri divides the group to deal with the assassins, counting one group short before Kiriha introduces their new club members to her. Later, Akito and Mimane arrive at Kazuya's house agreeing to help. Mimane shows off her mirror powers to Taguri, including footage of Kyukuri in the bath and Taguri suggests they be friends. While waiting for the assassins to arrive, Taguri tells the others to keep their opponents alive so they can be interrogated later. Just as she says so, the four Tsugumomo appear walking down the street towards them. Shortly after Akito and Arumi arrive in Meoiga, Mimin pesters Arumi about wanting to bathe together, which Arumi rejects after what happened previously. Akito and Chikage arrive at the room with Chikage having brought a futon for the two of them to share. She teases them about it and Arumi gets a little flustered. Akito and Chikage leave to spar and Mimane leaves with them, leaving Arumi alone in the house. Akito storms back into the room, getting all handsy with Arumi and pinning her to the ground. Arumi's like, fine, do your thing, but then Akito busts out in Mimane's voice, exposing herself as the master of disguise. Arumi's not having any of it and starts wrestling with Mimane, tossing her around like a ragdoll. But just when things couldn't get any weirder, the real Akito and Chikid strut back in, catching Arumi with Mimane in a compromising position. Akito's quick to slam the door shut and they hightail it out of there before Arumi can even explain herself. Genbu confronts Akito and Mimane, telling him not to interfere. Akito states it is not yet time to strike. Genbu reminds Akito of how many of their comrades have fallen waiting, but Akito simply apologizes and the two prepare to battle. While running, Senga and Yungu are caught in a barrier set up by Taguri who then confronts them. Elsewhere, Kazuya and Kiriha battle Kayoyuka, struggling with their opponent as she taunts them. As Genbu and Akito fight, Mimane offers to help, but Akito rejects her offer. After an exchange of blows and landing a few slashes on Genbu, Akito warns him again to return to Meoiga but Genbu refuses. They clash again, but Genbu blocks Akito's attack with a scissor case, paralyzing him and then goes in for a finishing strike. Taguri struggles with her opponents and gets struck in the chest by Senga's fan, collapsing to the ground. The two claim Taguri underestimated them, saying their power rivals her after growing so old. Kazuya continues to struggle in his fight with Kayoyuka, being sent flying back. 
Kiriha returns to her human form to defend Kazuya from an oncoming attack. Kazuya's all like, let's bust out Ascension. But Kiriha's not having any of that nonsense, warning him about the dangers and telling him to battle smarter, not harder. But Kazuya's all fired up, dropping Kiriha's true name and forcing that Ascension power into action. Kaiyuk is straight up shook seeing someone pull off Ascension, while Kiriha's jaws on the floor cause Kazuya pulled out her true name like it's no big deal. With Ascension in play, Kazuya's straight up dominating blocking Kayuyuka's attacks left and right and pushing her into a corner. Kayuyuka begs for her life as Kazuya delivers the final blow while Kiriha tells Kazuya not to eliminate her. Kazuya's punch stops just short of Kayuyuka's gut and Kayuyuka collapses to her knees. Senga and Yungu brag about having easily defeated Tagiri, only for Tagiri to get up and reveal herself unharmed, unveiling a set of coin armor beneath her clothes. Done with gauging the enemy's power, Tagiri eliminates them instantly with her flowing iron sand which they in vain attempt to block. Kagiri steps on their destroyed bodies as she reminds herself that she was supposed to keep one alive for interrogation, but states they got what they deserved for targeting Kyukiri. Jenbu goes for a finishing strike on Akito when he is suddenly stopped, finding chopsticks embedded into his chest. Jenbu pulls the chopsticks out of himself and the two prepare for the final exchange. Jenbu is destroyed and Mimin reminds Akito of Tagiri telling them not to eliminate their opponents. Akito states it did not matter since Jenbu would not give up their secrets anyways. Mimin questions how Jenbu and his group were planning to take the stone shard back to Meoiga if they had succeeded since they would not have enough energy to travel back, especially if they knew they would be busy fighting them. Akito realizes that Jenbu's group was a distraction and he had more allies waiting to target Kyukiri. At the Hakusen Shrine, Kyukiri confronts 6 Tsugumomo from Meoiga, with Rikaku stepping up to eliminate Kyukiri in one swift blow. Nimain, Akito and Kazuya travel to Kyukiri's location via rooftops as fast as they can, only to arrive and witness Kyukiri destroy Rikaku with ease. The remaining assassin prepares to fight Kyukiri. Kazuya attempts to help but a barrier prevents him from getting any closer. Kyukiri quickly destroys her opponent leaving only the fishing rod Tsugumomo left. Both Kazuya and Akito are amazed by Kyukiri's power. The fishing rod Tsugumomo launches his final attack, summoning a large monstrous sea creature, but Kyukiri easily destroys it and eliminates him with a single attack. The barrier is released and the group meets up with Kyukiri. Kazuya, Mimane and Tagiri praise Kyukiri. Kazuya's ascension wears off and Kiriya returns to her human form, grappling Kyukiri for eliminating her opponents instead of leaving one alive as planned. Returning to the Kagami household, they find all the Meoiga Tsugumomo have been destroyed with the exception of Kayuyuka the flute which Kazuya battled. Kiria explains that after their battle, Kayuyuka collapsed and reverted back to her object form which Kyukiri surmises as her having used up too much energy. Kyukiri gives Kayuyuka to Kazuya to be his temporary partner in order to restore her spiritual energy. Kyukiri congratulates the group on a job well done and Tagiri suggests she takes a break as well, offering some sake. Kiriha states they should go to another room while leaving Kazuya and Kokayu to rest. Kazuya apologizes to Kiriha for using her true name to force commands onto her, but Kiriha does not respond. Akito and Mimain leave and begin to walk home. While walking, Erumi arrives to tell them there has been a revolt in Meoiga. Tagiri and Kyukuri help Kazuya bathe while he is paralyzed from using Ascension. Kyukuri acts very affectionate towards Kazuya, which Tagiri explains is because she got Kyukuri drunk earlier while celebrating. Tagiri records Kyukuri as she washes Kazuya's body with her own. Kazuya asks Tagiri for help but Tagiri charges him money for it. Kyukuri is laid up in bed with Kazuya after getting wasted and sick as a dog, while Tagiri Kaneyama's snapping pics of her sorry state. Kiriha's not messing around, demanding answers about the dang assassination attempt. Tagiri spills the beans, saying she's reached out to Takamagahara about the mess and breaks down the risks involved. Kazuya's all like, are they sending in more gods to back us up? But Tagiri shuts that mess down, explaining the dangers of bringing in reinforcements. She tells them that they contacted Suzura Temple who will send help. The doorbell rings and Kiriha goes to answer it, being met with Sanao Sumeragi and Kotsu. Akito, Arumi, Mimain and Yasuki arrive in Meoiga, witnessing several smoking buildings in the distance. They are suddenly surrounded by clay constructs from Sanjiru which attack them. Mimain uses her abilities to find Sanjiru amongst the clay figures, allowing Akito to eliminate him. Chikage arrives to greet them, explaining Sanjiru was the last of the revolters and telling them to speak with Tanman for more details. Mimain tackles Chikage to give her a hug, causing one of Sanjiru's constructs to fall on them. Akito and Yasuki speak with Tanman who explains the entire radical group within Meoiga rebelled and in Jenbu's absence the remaining Tsugumomo ran amok. 
Yasuki asks how they could have accomplished such feats when the village leaders were more powerful. Tanman explains they committed the sin of feeding on humans to gain power. He reminds the two that though Maoiga is a gathering of Tsukimagami who are fed up with humans, Tsukimagami cannot exist without humans and is forbidden to do such a thing. Akito tells Tanman that Erumi and the other girls went to take a bath after getting covered in Sanjuryu's mud. Tanman gets up to leave, but is stopped by Yurara and Sarara. Chikage, Erumi, Mimain and Erumi take a bath in the hot springs. Meanwhile, Tanman is left tied up alone. Kazuya wakes up and heads to the bathroom where he finds Sunao naked and is punched for walking in. Hyukuri explains to Kazuya that Sunao and Kotsu were sent as reinforcements by Tsuzura Temple. Sunao tells them that they will be living at Kazuya's place for the time being. Sunao transfers to Kazuya's school where she introduces herself to her class. Sunao begins fantasizing about going to the same school as Kazuya before realizing he is in a different class. Meanwhile, Shiru expresses his excitement at the news of a new attractive transfer student, only to be met with little surprise from Kazuya and Kiriha. Sunao sulks in class after ending up separated from Kazuya, but fires herself up over the other opportunities they will have to interact. Shiru is shocked at the fact that Sunao is joining their personal advice club. Kazuya explains Sunao's reason for coming and how Kyukuri was attacked the previous day. Sunao then takes Kazuya out to train under the bridge where Sunao begins choking out Kazuya for bailing out on his previously promised training sessions. Kazuya and Sunao spar unarmed and Kazuya admits defeat. At home, Kazuya is blindfolded while bathing with Sunao. Prior to leaving home, Suzuri Sumeragi told Sunao that staying at Kazuya's home would be a prime opportunity to build their relationship. Sunao denies liking Kazuya but Suzuri pulls a photo of Kazuya she had as evidence of the contrary. Suzuri warns Sunao that she will know if she failed to make any progress with Kazuya. Sunao explains her bathing with Kazuya was her mother's idea and they need to fool her. While bathing together, Sunao asks Kazuya if something had happened between him and Kiriha. Kazuya spills the beans about how he whipped out Kiriha's true name to give her orders, apologizing like a broken record and swearing up and down he won't pull that stunt again. But, Kira is still holding a grudge, giving him the cold shoulder. Sunao ain't holding back, laying it out for Kazuya that Kira isn't just mad about the name thing, but she's sick of being treated like some tool. Kazuya's gotta wrap his head around that. Finally, Kazuya mans up and tells Kiriha straight up that she's his one and only Tsukimagami partner, and he's down to ride with her till the end of time. Later, Sunao and Kazuya spar again under the bridge, this time using their Tsugumomo and with Kyukuri overseeing them while Asamu, Chisato and Shiru watch. After they are done, Kazuya thanks Sunao for helping him resolve things with Kiriha. Kazuya tells Sunao that she is a great friend, disappointing Sunao and causing her to sulk. By a river, Akito contemplates his conversation with Kazuya before he leaves. Kazuya told Akito he was not going to torture answers out of Kayoyuka, understanding that she and the other Meoiga may have been unfairly treated by humans, but wishing to find good partners for all of them so there would be no need for conflict. Arumi arrives to tell Akito that Tanman is calling for a meeting. At the meeting, Tanman tells the group that after Arumi's divination had shown two stone shards, he had decided to rewaken Mirahi. Mirahi introduces himself to the group and apologizes for his failings causing the group trouble. Chikage asks about his shard's curse and stability, but Mirahi explains he has learned to control it. Tanman announces that Meoiga will now begin their full assault on Kyukuri to claim her stone shard. As the shrine attendant is sweeping the ground, he suddenly spots some freaky mess going down nearby. Dude's jaw drops when he sees this massive frickin' ship bust out of the ground and soar into the sky, carrying the Meoiga Tsukimagami. Meanwhile, on the boat, the crew's losing their minds, unable to wrap their heads around Mirahi pulling off this epic stunt. Akito's geeking out, calling it fascinating, but Mirahi is quick to shut that down, explaining it's all thanks to some shard. He goes on about handling the fusion and flight like it's no biggie, then pulls some ninja moves to cloak the ship. Meanwhile, Kyukuri is blowing up about the invasion, hitting up Kiriha and Kazuya Kagami with the deets. Kazuya, Kiriha, Kyukuri, Sana Sumeragi, and Kotsu haul to Hakusen Shrine, gearing up for the enemy's arrival. Tagiri Kaneyama arrives with Omoikane Yagakoro who introduces himself to Kazuya. Kyukuri tells Kokayu to remain in bed to heal, but Kokayu refuses. Kyukuri thanks everyone for supporting her and thinks to herself she may need to use her last resort. Meanwhile, Azami observes Kamioka from the outskirts of the town's barrier. Prior to arriving there, Azami spoke with Miyurahi and the Meoiga members, telling them not to harm Kamioka's exorcist, Kazuya. Miyurahi and Tanman both state fighting him would be difficult to avoid. Azami grows angry and begins emitting curses before Akito calms her down stating he will deal with Kazuya and Kiriha. Azami tells them she will not be joining the battle as she cannot enter Kamioka. As Meoiga approaches Kamioka, Miyurahi gives a speech reminding them of what they must do. 
they are suddenly caught in a mesh of fire, dispelling their invisibility. A projection of Hanoka reveals herself and warns them to retreat. Mirahi signals to Mimin to take action. The Meoigatsu Kimigami battle with Hanoka's projection until she destroys the ship, only for it to be revealed to be an illusion. Hanoka realizes the ship was a decoy and their forces have already split apart to reach Kamioka. Right before Hanoka can dip to link up with their main squad, Yasuki lays down the law. Meanwhile, Mirai's crew storms Hakusen Shrine, ready to throw down. They exchange some basic-ass intros with Kyukuri's crew, but it's all just pre-game bull before Mirahi and Kyukuri go head-to-head -head in a hardcore showdown. It's a freaking bloodbath, mano a mano, and Kazuya's like, yo, let me get in on this action. But Kyukuri's not having any of his mess, brushing him off like he's nothing. As Kyukuri begins to struggle, she releases the barrier she had created around Kamioka to return herself to her full power. With her full power, Kyukuri easily overpowers Miyurahi. As he struggles to get up, Chikich calls out to Miyurahi but he tells his forces to stay back. Kazuya tells Mirahi to stop, stating they can find good owners for all of them, but Mirahi expresses his doubts. As Mirahi goes in for a final attack, he is suddenly eliminated by Azami, impaling him through the back and taking his stone shard. The two Azami reveal themselves as Kyukuri realizes they had been waiting for this moment the entire time. Azami gives the stone shard to Kanaka Kagami's body and Kazuya recognizes Kanaka as his mother. Arumi and Akito watch from behind the bushes, shocked at the turn of events. Prior to entering battle, Mirahi told the others he would fight one-on-one -on -one with Kyukuri to decrease casualties. Mirahi confirmed with Arumi that his decision had an acceptable outcome, telling them only to interfere if they foresee something bad happening. Akito is frustrated that for some reason they were unable to predict Azami betraying them despite using Arumi's divination. As Hinoka battles the Meoiga forces, their ship suddenly reveals itself. Yasuki calls out to Mifun, who tells him that Mirahi's power has vanished and he is no longer able to maintain the ship. The ship collapses and dozens of Tsukimagami revert to their original forms as they fall. Shin catches Tanman but tells him he does not have enough power to catch everyone. Hanoka catches the falling Tsukimagami and Tanman questions why she would help them. Hanoka tells them the fight has already ended and Mirahi has died. She tells them to give up or risk more casualties, offering to use her power to keep them alive. Tanman reluctantly accepts and the remaining Meoja forces surrender. Kanaka is revived with Mirahi's stone shard, quickly clothing herself in Azami's obai as she awakens. Kanaka thanks the two Azamis before greeting Kyukuri and her old friends. Kiriha is shocked that Kanaka is still alive after she believed she eliminated her. Kyukuri tells them there is no time for a full explanation, simply telling Kazuya that the two Azamis are Amasogi he created which have possessed Kanaka. Kazuya's mind's freaking reeling, getting bombarded with visions of his past, every dang second and reminding him of when Kanaka got freaking slaughtered. He's desperate to save his mom. She's like, bro, your mom's already gone. The Amasoga's after you now. Kyukuri lays it out straight for Kazuya, saying he's the only one who can take these losers down. If he doesn't man up, not only is he gonna get hit with a curse backlash that'll straight up end his sorry ass, but the whole region's gonna feel the freaking heat too. And just when Kazuya's trying to wrap his head around all this, ready to throw down with her own son, the forces of Meoiga and Kamioka witness Kanaka Kagami's resurrection. Kanaka prepares to battle Kazuya, Kyukuri and the others. Exit. In the intense battle, Amoike and Yagakoro, Sunao Sumeragi, and Kyukuri team up against Kanaka, who manages to evade most attacks. Discapacitated. Before her enemies can deliver the finishing blow, Azami intervenes, ambushing them. Despite Kyukuri's attempts to retaliate, Kanaka emerges victorious, using Ascension to defeat Kyukuri and claim her stone shard. Enraged, as they face off against Kanaka, a mysterious pillar of light emerges from the Hakusen Shrine, leading to Kazuya awakening in his room, alone and confused. His father calls him down to the living room where he, Bakura and Aohai Oriabana await. Aohai introduces herself and explains what happened after he lost consciousness. When Aohai and her team arrived at Hakusen, Aohai tells Kazuya the battle occurred three days ago, telling him the fates of the combatants on their side. Kazuya asks about Kyukuri to which Aohai informs him has passed away. He asks about Kira and she shows him her collected remains, leaving him speechless. Kazuya rests in bed. She tells Kazuya that they have no other option to deal with Kanaka other than Kazuya himself. She tells Kazuya he is to come by train at Suzura Temple, telling him he has no choice in the matter, but still wishes he will choose to do so willingly. Aohai asks Kazuya what he will do, but he does not respond. Some time after Aohai and Bakura leave his room, he thinks about Kiriha and Kyukuri begins to cry. Kazuya washes his face and prepares to leave. Kazuya regained his resolve so quickly. Before leaving, Kazuya speaks with his father. Kazuaki admits he, like the other, knew what was going on, but Kazuya thanks the other for protecting him for so long.